couple of weeks ago, I had the very great pleasure of introducing you to a brand new hero. Or perhaps an anti-hero. I still haven't quite made up my mind yet myself. Anyway, the exploits of the dark web fixer and his intriguing, mysterious warehouse in Florida certainly piqued your interests. So, I'm delighted to be returning there once again this evening. Now, my dear friends, I know you've all had a long, hard week, and you're looking forward to the weekend, so I think you all deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, because, once again, it's time to listen. There haven't been any stirrings as of yet, and I still doubt there will be. And so, on to the next, as they say. This one may come back to bite me, though. I never did find out who was involved with it at all. Bits and pieces here and there over the years, but, well, today's story still has some loose ends. And though it'll make me keep an eye over my shoulder for the first time in a long time, I will divulge it to you anyway. It never sat right with me, what I found. It was about five years ago. By then, I had a well-established system going. The warehouse is divided up into four total sections, not including the office space. The two in the rear I use for dark web business, shipments that come and go. The closer to my legitimate business, the longer the storage times. Fewer people coming and going keeps curious eyes where they belong. However, there's still a section between my repair shop and the first of the two shipping sections, and it's in here that I store stuff. Mostly my own belongings, but occasionally I'll have customers from both businesses ask to store something for a while. It acts as a buffer between my businesses, but what really gets stored in there may be a story for another day. At this point in time, I was really running a big operation. I'd hired my friend, who'd set up all the security gadgets that I'd told you about last time. He knew the score. He was cool, and I trusted him. He helped me keep things running smoothly. So smooth I could even take time off when I wanted to. One of the hiccups I encounter from time to time is when a shipment becomes abandoned. It can happen for any number of reasons, and I do my best to get to the bottom of some of these rabbit holes. I try contacting the sellers, the courier networks, and even the buyers. I'll reach out, see if there's any word or movement out of the groups, and if not... Well, I take possession of whatever the shipment is. In the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty rare occurrence, well, with the hundreds of shipments that get moved through my hands every week. If you spread out the events on a timeline, though, it would appear to be much more frequent, once every few months or so. I reach out within a respectable time frame after the pickup is supposed to be made. If it's something short-term, it's usually the same day that I notice it's still sitting around. Long term, on the other hand, can be a couple of days to a week. I'll spend anywhere from a few hours to a few days attempting to contact people before I write it off. What's in these shipments isn't usually very interesting or out of the ordinary, well, to me anyway. Guns, drugs, stolen goods, <laughs> the occasional human organ. Pretty typical black market goods. These items I'll be able to turn around and get rid of pretty quick. There's always a buyer. There'll be some things that I keep, and occasionally odd specific things that I'll just pawn off to a broker to see if they can find a buyer. These are usually weird trinkets or artifacts or things I just don't have any knowledge on. I had a shipment that sat in my long-term storage lane for almost three months, and a week after its pickup date came and went, I started reaching out like I usually do. The shipment was a pair of crates, about four feet on all sides. A large shipment that cost a large sum of money to keep for three months. And when I couldn't get through to buyer or seller, I did what I usually did. Took possession of it for myself. I dragged them with a pallet jack into my office space in the rear. Through one of the double doors one at a time. And set to work opening up the crates and going through them. Laying things out so I knew exactly what I had. When I opened the lid on the first crate, I found a letter addressed to a zero atop a pile of unorganized boxes. Shoe boxes, Home Depot boxes, post office boxes, 
There was no semblance of organisation, man. No labels on anything. I didn't know where to start. And so, I started with a letter. It was handwritten, in excellent penmanship. A simple and short message. That which you have requested. J. Hmm. Cryptic, right? Well, to this day, I don't know who the recipient or the sender were. I really did try to find out, though. Mostly because I wanted my storage money at the time. Now, the following is what I was able to gather. It's mostly from memory, so the details are probably imperfect. The sender, Jay, had used a broker to ship the goods to an unnamed recipient. The name Zero wasn't a name or a moniker. It was an acronym. So it wasn't a who it was getting shipped to, but whom. I got in touch with a broker the sender had used, who told me simply that a guy had somehow gotten a hold of her personal phone number, called from a payphone, and told her that he had a client wanting to ship a package to Orlando without any eyes watching it. Oh, and that money wasn't an object. So, I had Jay, who used a proxy, to get in touch with a broker, who was to ship this stuff to some group by the name of Zero in Orlando. And, well, I'd like to share what I know about Zero, but I don't think it'd be very beneficial for my life expectancy. I will say that the group isn't a group anymore, but ex-members are still quite powerful in their own right, even all these years later. None of the ones I could find at the time made the order, nor did they know who did, and so I left it at that. The broker then told me they'd used four different convoys to make the delivery, Three of those were decoys. Each convoy contained three unmarked big rigs. In the convoy that did carry the goods, only one of the three rigs held the shipment. Other than the two crates, every other truck on the route was completely empty. Now, I only knew of two companies that could make that kind of play at the time. Neither of them were cheap on a regular shipping route. Pooling those kind of resources for such a small delivery is a loss of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so, for it to be worth the effort, they'd need to do more than just break even with the cost of and effective losses from regular deliveries. From what I gathered later on, the final ticket was in the range of seven figures, paid in full before delivery. After it reached my warehouse, a three-month time span was to pass before the buyer would accept delivery through their own courier. So, why hadn't they? Something had to have gone wrong for such an expensive shipment to now be in my hands. But before I get to that, I'm going to tell you what I found in the crates. The boxes were filled with paperwork, pictures, legal documents, odd trinkets, clothes, and so on. At first glance, it looked like boxes of stuff you'd take with you when you move. Just a bunch of junk you're too sentimental to throw out, or whatever. When I started looking closer, though, there were patterns that started to jump out at me. In every picture, in every single one, the same man appeared. He wasn't facing the camera in most of them either. It was like someone had been following him, snapping shots of him doing things in his normal life, from eating lunch, working an office job, even to hiking in the woods. There were others, though, like where he was at a bar with other people, looking right into the camera. There were more than a few of these. A couple of weddings, some that looked like family dinners, even some when he was um, in relations with others, men and women alike. These disturbed me most, as they were taken from within the same room. But not in a single one did it feel like there was just a camera on a stand with a timer. No, it was too organic, too fluid, too in the moment for every photo. And it got weird at the deeper I dug. In one box I found credit card statements, bank accounts, loan information, checks, and student information. Another one was open letters, rolled up magazines, and newspaper clippings. Someone was digging up every scrap of information on this guy, and it was all here in these two crates. What had to be years worth of accumulated research on one guy. In the second crate I found some more nefarious material. 
stacks of external storage drives and USB sticks, piles of CDs and even a few VHS tapes, including the second box, looked to be the equipment used to take the photos and do all of this research, cameras, toolkits and other kinds of surveillance equipment. At this point, something in the back of my mind was telling me to collect all of what I had and just burn it, just dump it and get rid of it all. But I couldn't. I was transfixed, my curiosity carrying me forward, digging through box after box. In one of the final boxes, wrapped in paper, I found an urn, full of ashes. It wasn't remarkable or ornate, but it was accompanied by a death certificate. The actual death certificate, not a copy. And we'll call him Tim. Sorry, I'm not good at coming up with names. This Tim died at the age of 37, the cause being a single gunshot wound. It was also said he was cremated and his ashes were left to his family. Now, I could have been wrong. There was a possibility that the ashes in the urn were not his, but that wouldn't have lined up with everything else I had, would it? Call it a gut feeling. But there was now a dead man on my property. Not that there probably hadn't been before. <laughs> I'm sure that grave robbers and the bodies they sold had come through my hands from time to time. It really doesn't bother me that much. But this, however, this whole thing unnerved me. And I kept digging. Invested now in finding out what was going on. The last box I came across had inside a series of deeds. You know, deeds for land and buildings. And more than one. There were even a few here in the central Florida area, one about an hour from my own home. Even more interesting was a P.O. box key attached to a note with an address and a date of only a few weeks before I'd received the shipment. I'd started this process on a Sunday morning, one of my days off. I didn't have anything going on anyway, so I'd spent the day going through everything and sorting it on a set of tables in one of the back rooms that could be locked from the outside. It was starting to get late in the afternoon, when I stood up to stretch and noticed that I'd smoked a pack of cigarettes and not eaten all day. So I broke down the two large crates and walked them out of the dumpster at the back of the property in pieces. Flagging down one of the local homeless guys, I handed him a roll of one dollar bills and told him to burn the wood from in the dumpster that night. He nodded and shuffled off. I used them on occasion to get rid of stuff I didn't want sitting around or getting carried off to the landfill where it could be recovered. After going back inside, I sat down at my desk in the office, a couple of the storage drives, the deeds, and P.O. Box information in front of me, deciding what to do about it all. The nagging feeling returned, urging me to put it all behind me and just get rid of everything I had and not look back. But it had been so long since I'd done what I called field work. Field work on the dark web is exactly what it sounds like it would be. It could be tracking someone, taking photos, breaking and entering, muggings, killings, you name it. All the dirty actions that people are hired to perform on the dark web I consider to be called field work. The guy who had accumulated all of the stuff, sitting in the now locked up office, had been doing a whole lot of this field work. I decided I'd tip my toes back into the water, see what more I could dig up about this whole thing. It was approaching early evening when I pulled out a spare laptop and plugged in one of the hard drives. On the drive I found about a terabyte of data. All of it was encoded. The other three drives I tried were all encoded. So, I called up my partner and asked him if he was free that night, which he was. After having packed up a box worth of deeds, drives, and the P.O. box information, I went home. I packed a couple of days' worth of clothes in a bag, a silenced handgun with spare clips, some nighttime gear, oh, and a wad of cash. I loaded everything into one of my cars and drove to my partner's house. I'm going to go ahead and dispel a pretty common rumor while I'm on the topic. The people you see driving around lifted trucks with big racks and lights, blacked out paint, windows and wheels, <laughs> they don't actually do anything shady. 
I mean, that shit is way too obvious. No, usually when someone is doing field work, they don't want to be noticed. They buy cars that are a few years old, but in good condition. We keep our registration up to date. We don't have loud exhausts, fancy wheels, or really dark winter tint. We blend in and follow the laws. We're the people in the dull, boring colored Toyotas, Kias, and Volkswagens. Standing out brings unwanted attention. But, like I said, what I was driving this time was a personal car. I wasn't sure what I'd be getting myself into, so I was bringing along something fast and utilitarian. A station wagon. I'm a big car guy, and I have some fun customizing my cars, but there were a few that I kept pretty low-key. In car culture, we call them sleepers. Badass, hopped-up monsters, concealed beneath a mask of normality. My station wagon looks like a grocery getter, but it hauls ass like a race car. Now, my partner, we'll call him Carter, didn't live alone. He had roommates who were not privy to what he did. Carter lived on the second floor of the house and rented two rooms. One he worked out of, one he lived out of. With the money I supplied him for his work for me, he kept his gear very up to date. I like computers, and I can do what anyone with access to YouTube can do, but his skill set was that of many years in the field working for big companies doing everything from cybersecurity to building servers. So if anyone was going to be able to find out what was on these drives, it was him. It was well into the night when I arrived, and he was expecting me. Smoking on the front porch when I arrived, he put out his cigarette and we went inside and up to his workroom without speaking. Once the door was closed, the conversation began. So, what have you got, Jack? He asked, easing himself into his large leather desk chair. I handed him one of the hard drives and sat down on the couch he kept in the corner of the room. Some kind of encrypted files on a bunch of drives. Those crates were filled with some deep research on some dude named Tim. I want to know what's on the drives that were in one of the boxes. He nodded, turning around to the impressive computer display behind him, and started opening up a couple of different programs. You plug this into anything yet? Nothing important. One of the burners. It didn't do anything funny that I could tell. But I didn't have it online either, so who knows? He paused. Okay, and I'll kill my internet feed as well, just in case. Do what you gotta do. I swung my feet up onto the couch and lay down to nap. Just let me know what you find. I was asleep about an hour when he woke me. I rubbed the sleep away and sat up to listen to him. So, I got this thing open on a virtual machine, right? And I'm running it through a couple of programs to decode the thing. And now, this. He pointed to one of the screens that was displaying a message box I'd never seen before. I just looked at him, waiting for his explanation. These files need a program I have not seen used in the crypto field in years. So, can you open them? Yeah, but these files are long videos. And hours and hours of footage, he said. It'll take me time to do them all. I've got one ready for playback, if you want to see what's on it. Load it to a USB, and I'll watch from my laptop while you keep working, I said, pulling the laptop I brought from its carry case. Carter set back to work after giving me the video loaded onto a drive. Plugging it in and opening it for viewing, I was met with a still frame of text. It gave a date and timestamp, as well as an address that I'd seen before in one of the deeds. I plugged in my headphones and hit play. It started as a black screen, and like someone was setting up additional cameras and plugging them into the feed. News views started popping up down the left side of the screen. The first was a green tinted night vision camera. The second was a military grade black and white thermal imaging camera. And the third was an ultraviolet camera. All of them were centered on a house surrounded by a heavily wooded area. The video log in the lower right corner of the screen started ticking. Zero days, zero hours, zero minutes, one second. 
I scrolled along the slider to see how long the video was. 24 hours even. I listened to the audio. It was quiet, aside from the sound of nature all around. Little animals moving about. The wind rustling leaves in the trees. The occasional sound of a small branch falling or being broken underfoot of wildlife. I watched for a few minutes, waiting to see if I could see anything unusual happening. When nothing did, I skipped ahead. I noticed change around what I would assume to be dawn. A light turned on within the house. And a new camera turned on. This time on the right side of the screen. Regular viewing spectrum, but from inside the house. Angled down, and viewing a hallway with several doors. The one at the end opened, and the guy from all the photos entered the frame. It had to be Tim. Other views started turning on. A kitchen, living room, bedrooms. I watched as this guy got ready for his day. Made breakfast and coffee. Took his morning dump, and got into his car and left. I closed the laptop. I didn't need to see any more. I packed my stuff back into the bag and stood up, stretching my back out. Carter, I'll leave you to it. Looks like they had this Tim guy on 24-hour video surveillance. <laughs> I'll leave the rest of these with you. I patted the top of the box. I sat down on a chair while I'd come into the room. Let me know if you find anything out of the ordinary. Out of the ordinary, Jack? He looked at me. This whole thing is out of the ordinary. Surveillance footage in and of itself wasn't uncommon to see on the dark web. There were whole sites you could access for a fee and just watch people going about their lives, oblivious to the fact they were being recorded. I never really delved into it. Didn't pique my interest all that much. I could watch people in Orlando all I wanted for free. But paired with all the other information I had on this guy now, it was suspect to say the least. I've said before, I don't like getting involved in things I don't have to. But now, I was sitting on the deeds to several properties and more than a couple of years' worth of information on one guy. Maybe I could make some extra money in some way. That's what I was telling myself at the time, at least. But I only shrugged and left my friend behind. Once back in the car, I looked through the box of deeds to find the address that matched the footage I'd just watched. Turned out the house was in Georgia, and I wasn't going to make the first excursion such a far one. I honestly was more interested in the P.O. box than what it contained. I cross-checked to see if any of the other deeds were within a reasonable distance. It just so happened that there were two. One was allocated residential, the other was commercial. Plugging in the location of the P.O. box took me about an hour outside of Orlando to the south. I decided I'd visit there first, find out what's inside, and then look into the residential property, followed by the commercial one, all in the same town. Glancing at the clock on the dashboard as I put the car in drive, I decided I'd race it. GPS said my arrival time was estimated at 1.30am. Smiling a little to myself, I turned on the car sport mode and hit the road. A few minutes of tight city roads, and then... Onto the highway I drove. Now, in Orlando, the main highway that runs through the center of it is called I-4. It's always under construction, and the speed limits are always changing. Traffic sucks, and it takes an hour to get anywhere. But it was near midnight on a Saturday night. People were already mostly where they wanted to be, and the highway was relatively clear. Another note to make is... Nobody actually follows the speed limits on I-4. 80 miles an hour is normal, and the police really don't bother you unless you're in triple digits. Not that I would have stopped anyway. Once so I was through Orlando, past the theme parks, and into the open roadway that stretched down to the southwestern side of Florida, I really let the car breathe, hitting 150 miles an hour in some places. I'd driven these roads more than I care to admit, and I knew where the highway patrol hid. And they only use the planes for traffic enforcement during the day. So, needless to say, I beat the GPS timer by quite a bit. Arriving a half hour ahead of schedule, or to the town anyway, I slowed down and cruised quietly through the sleepy city. It was an older town. 
Many of the buildings were dilapidated, and other than the streetlights, almost everything was dark. The P.O. box was in a small post office near the town centre. I pulled into a parking lot a block away and walked the rest of the distance, the gun in my waistband and my hands stuffed into my jacket pockets. I looked up and down the street before entering the post office parking lot. No people, no stray animals, and only a single set of taillights disappearing off into the night miles away. It was eerie and unsettling. I breathed deep, the jitters in my stomach cropping up as they always did. I had to stay focused and alert, but the nerves made it difficult. I pulled on a pair of black latex gloves and reached for the door, opening it and stepping into the reception area, looking around at the rows of mailboxes. The area to drop off packages to the right was closed and locked up tight with one of those roll-down cages, but a couple of fluorescent tube lights kept the mailbox room lit. I pulled out the key and the piece of paper with the note on it. I unfolded the note and read it to myself again. Box number 34. Insert paper in the bottom left side of the box before opening. I walked to the first aisle and started scanning the rows. Found the box and did as instructed. Slipping the paper in and opening the lock, the door popped open. Carefully, I opened it further my heart jumping into my throat when I saw why I'd been instructed to put the paper in the slot. A circuit, the two contacts being kept separate by the note, was connected on one side to a large battery pack, on the other, a clump of plastic explosive. In the door was a plastic wedge that had kept the two wires apart when the door was closed. Oh, jeez, I whispered under my breath. Other than the explosive... There was a package wrapped in brown paper, the number one written on it in black marker. I looked over my shoulder, only seeing my own hooded reflection in the window to the outside. I made sure the package itself wasn't attached to any kind of booby trap before picking it up, closing the door and locking it afterwards. I turned and left the building, package under one arm and my head lowered to keep the cameras from seeing my face on the way out. I crossed the parking lot, the street, and walked down the block to my car, keeping my shoulders up and looking around consistently. I'd modified the car's lights not to blink or turn on when I unlocked the doors. It allowed me to get in and out of it without anyone really noticing, unless they were watching, of course. And even then, if I was careful, I could still get away with it. I had enough practice doing it, after all. I was parked in a lot with a couple of other cars, and I hadn't seen anyone following me, but I decided to wait for a bit, just in case. Setting the package in the passenger seat and the gun in the center console, I waited. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Nobody. So I started the car, lights off, and drove out into the street, only turning them on once I'd driven a mile or so. No cars following, so I pulled off again. Parking in the only fast food place that ever stays open for 24 hours a day, McDonald's. I drove through the drive through paying cash, and pulled out into the parking lot. I wasn't particularly hungry, but I needed a reason to be parked in a running car for a little bit without drawing attention. Carefully, I opened the package. Inside was another key and note, but also an old recording tape. Curiously, it was from Tim. The note read, I'm probably dead, but the truth doesn't have to be. At the time, I didn't have a way to play the tape. It was one of those micro-cassette tapes that people used to use back in the 90s. These days, you just use an SD card. So, it would have to wait until I returned home. I was pretty sure I had one laying around the house in a box someplace that I hadn't used since my college days. So, I ate my fast food and drove off. A little less worried about being followed, but still keeping an eye in the mirror. When I arrived at the house, I knew right away that it had been abandoned some time ago. The windows were dusty, the curtains drawn closed, the paint was peeling, the roof was in disrepair, and the yard was quite overgrown. 
It sat at the end of a long dirt road, with only a few other houses on it. Chances of finding anything here seem slim, but stranger things have happened. I pulled directly into the driveway, not really concerned with being seen this time. If someone was down here, they'd be looking for trouble, like myself. I walked right up to the front door and knocked. Feeling confident that there wouldn't be anyone home, but just in case, I didn't want to stumble into anything either. No lights, no sounds, nobody home. I walked around the back, peering in the windows that weren't covered. This place was a wreck inside. It looked like it had been vacated in a hurry. The back door was ajar. The window was broken, which indicated that it hadn't been anyone in my line of work. We don't leave a trace like that if we can help it. I pushed the door open with a gun barrel, peeking inside the dark depths. Entering slowly, I swept room to room. As I thought, nobody home. It had been picked clean of valuables. Nothing hung on the walls. There were no TVs or computers, no jewellery, or even coins on the floor. Something on the floor in the hallway did catch my eye, though. A small area rug had been pushed aside. A very subtle gap in the floor was visible. Someone had probably kicked it aside by accident, because the latch underneath was still undisturbed. It was recessed into the floor, and appeared to be held in place by some flimsy trim screws. And I know what I just said about not leaving any trace behind, but this place had been ransacked more than once already, and some floor latch that was screwed into rotting wood wasn't going to stop me. But before I ripped the floor up, I hesitated a moment, thinking about the key in the box from the post office. And wouldn't you know it, the key fit. The lock clicked open, and inside was a shallow little nook, in which sat another small package. This one labelled with a number two, I picked it up, left the building after looking around once more, and walked out to the car to leave. Inside was another key, a note and tape. The note only gave the address to the commercial property that I had planned to visit as it was. Coincidence or otherwise, these packages were making my night worth the trip out here. The short trip to the commercial property was about ten minutes, but I was starting to feel my lack of sleep. I'd been up for about 20 hours, and my warm bed back home was calling me. The industrial park was small, but the warehouses here were all in good shape and well maintained. The one I found myself parked in front of was curiously marked number 34, the same as the post office box. I was still being cautious, but with it being almost three in the morning, I was ready to get out of this little town. I approached the door leading into the warehouse. The paint on the metal worn away in places people had been grabbing it over the years. I noticed that this place had also been untouched for some time. The door handle to the warehouse space next door, only a few feet away, was shiny, while this one was clouded over. For those of you who don't know, the oils on your hands will actually keep metal clean if you touch it enough. The place next door was definitely used often. I slid the key in, unlocked the door and pushed. It groaned open, the hinges rusty. The smell inside was that of uncirculated air, musty and wet. There wasn't much inside, some junk and trash gathered about, but otherwise the floor was bare. In the back was a table with an old cream-coloured filing cabinet. I approached it, small pocket flashlight in hand. Rummaging through the top two drawers, I only found a couple of loose pieces of paper. Handwritten notes about things coming and going from the place. It seemed an awful lot like the notes I took on a daily basis. The bottom drawer held another small package, with the number three on it. As I was closing the drawer, I heard the sound of a car pulling through the parking lot. Suddenly, I wasn't tired anymore. This place had felt like a ghost town right up until a few minutes ago, but now I could feel eyes on me, even through the walls. I picked up my pace, walking out and pulling the door closed behind me and locking it while I looked around. 
I noticed three cars in the parking lot that were not there when I'd arrived. Two to the far side, and one that was parked only a few dozen feet away. My adrenaline spiked. Heart racing, I stuffed the package in my coat and reached for my car keys. Just about to get into my car, when I heard a voice from behind me. I don't think I've seen you around here before. It came from the darkness and damn near made me jump out of my skin. Play it cool, I told myself. You're outnumbered at least three to one. I opened the car door as I turned to face a man with a well-weathered face. His eyes were a piercing blue that I could see even in the darkness. Uh, yeah, my boss asked me to come check on the place, I said quickly, falling into as professional a role as I could muster. He said he hadn't been by in a while to check on it. It wasn't much of a lie, but it had gotten me out of a tight spot before, and it was the only thing I could think of on the spot. This time of night? Suspicious didn't even begin to describe the tone in his voice. Yeah, I'm on my way south, I said, trying to pull an all-nighter from up north. Oh yeah? He raised an eyebrow. Look, I, I gotta get going. I'm behind schedule as it is. I sat down in the car. The man was silent, watching me carefully. In an attempt to throw him off, I said, You know, sneaking up on someone like that is looking for trouble. Without skipping a beat, he responded. You know, wearing gloves like that is looking for trouble. Shit. I'd totally forgotten about them in the moment. I faltered. So what? I'm a germaphobe. Sue me. Closed the door and started the car. I didn't want to seem too rushed, but I was in a hurry now. I backed out and started to drive down the street when the lights in the cars ahead turned on. There were three cars and only two exits to the complex. I noticed the car that was now behind me was parked across the road in the other exit. So I beelined it for the other one, which was quickly becoming a passive race between myself and the two other cars. They didn't know I was packing heat though. I rolled down my window and ready my gun in my left hand, smashing the bottle and gunning it for the exit. They tried, but didn't quite make it before me, and I pulled into the service road, where there was another car blocking me off. Oh, f <laughs> I stuck my arm out the window and started popping off shots. They smacked off the front of their cars, taking out a headlight, going through the grill and puncturing tires. I wasn't aiming for them, but I wasn't going to take chances. The car backed up into the ditch on the side of the road, and I flew past, rolling up the window and tossing the gun into the passenger seat. I was completely ignoring all street laws now. There was nobody on the road anyway, and if a cop did see me, I wasn't stopping. I blew through the stop sign at the end of the road, turning on the main strip that ran through the town. A pair of headlights pulled out behind me. I chuckled to myself. <laughs> it should have caught me while I was out of the car. No stopping me now. I floored it the deep exhaust growling to life as the car dropped a gear and the speedometer started climbing. I went through the first red light doing about 50. A few blocks away, I went through a second red light doing 90. There was an empty stretch between the town and the highway, and that road became a drag strip. Foot to the floor, I was doing 160 with the headlights fading away behind me before I slowed to turn onto the ramp for I-4. I took it at a blistering speed, the wheels screeching and sliding just enough to make me second guess. But they stuck to the pavement like glue, and I was accelerating up towards Orlando at well over 150 miles an hour. I turned off onto one of the less travelled toll roads to keep my speed up, and I didn't slow down until I saw the Orlando skyline. In my haste, I'd forgotten about the package in my pocket. I was pretty sure I didn't have anything to worry about now, but I wasn't stopping until I got home. My exhaustion was at an all-time high as I pulled into my house, and I decided I'd find out what was on those tapes the next day. So, the tapes. What I found on them, I will not share. Well, not in full. 
What I will tell you is that Tim, well, Tim ran a business like I did. Dark web package distribution. The warehouse where I'd almost been jumped was just one of a few locations around the southeastern United States he'd operated out of. His tapes revealed that he'd come across some stuff from this group Zero. He didn't exactly say what, but it sounds like they hunted him down for it. They used to be in deep with human trafficking, but not on the selling end. They were big buyers, and well, that's all I'll say about that. Needless to say, I should have listened to my gut on the outset. I did, eventually. I had Carter wipe all of the drives clean and dispose of them, while I disposed of everything else. I'll probably lay low for a while. This was a hot topic in the community when it happened, and the chances of this stirring the pot... Well, let's just say that if someone from Zero stumbles across it, I may be doing more than just looking over my shoulder. Well, really glad to be back with that story this evening. Had a few weeks off, but I enjoyed that one just as much as the first part, and I hope you all do too. Well, thoughts, comments, any ideas? On, in the comments section below the video, and of course I will do my best, as ever, to join in the chat. Now, special shout out, again, to all those of you on the night shift. I know it can be a long, hard drag through the night, so I hope these stories help the time pass by a little bit more quickly. I've been there, I've done it, and I know what it's like. So, I'm with you guys. I hope this is adding to your evening's enjoyment. <laughs> well, anyway, I will be back again with you on Monday, of course, and I hope you'll join me again. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience... And come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?